Let's get started. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you might be joining us from. Um, welcome to a new year. Welcome to uh, our uh, unpacking of our first uh, big release of the year in 2023. This is our R1 release. We are here to talk about all things uh, Telerik, mostly .NET stuff for web, mobile, and desktop. So welcome. Uh, so uh, you um, likely know, uh, you know, the two of us here, I'll go back on to uh, getting fast on my, you know, uh, with my fingers, but it's Sam and Ed. Ed, how are you doing? I'm doing well, Sam. How about you? Not too bad, not too bad. So uh, yeah, welcome folks. Uh, this is the Telerik R1 webinar. Uh, and uh, that's Ed and me. If you need to get hold of us, you know, outside of the webinar, uh, we will talk about some of the folks who are also with us uh, in, in just a minute. But uh, we are here for your productivity, your success. Uh, what can we do uh, with uh, Telerik UI across all the major platforms uh, to try to get you folks to be a little bit more productive? So uh, we're going to talk about all things web from ASP.NET and Blazor and all the cool things to desktop and mobile. Uh, so it's going to be a fun, uh, fun time. Uh, now. Quick recap of where things uh, stand. We actually shipped uh, our R1 uh, release bits out on January 18th, so it's been uh, about a week. And then uh, last week we did a fun thing uh, just to kind of, you know, uh, get the release out of the door and just, you know, throw a big party. We had a Twitch stream, and if you have not joined us for the Twitch streams, we are over at uh, twitch.tv WAC uh, Coded Live, and uh, we had a really fun show where we, you know walked around all of our uh, the offices um, where our engineering folks are, our PMs and testing teams, everybody is. And uh, it was a lot of fun just trying to unpack everything that's in the release. But today we get to you know do a little deeper dive into every uh, one of the technologies and then see what's in it. Um, so if you're just joining us uh, you know, uh, for this webinar, uh, let's also tell you what's coming up next because uh, it's not just .NET that we do, uh, but today is going to be all things .NET. So uh, today is all things Telerik UI. So uh, like I said, you're going to have uh, Ed, our resident web expert, talk about you know all things web uh, across ASP.NET and MVC and Blazor and, uh, and Ajax. And I will come on and take over for all things mobile and desktop. That's across .NET MAUI and Xamarin and all of the hardcore Windows things like WPF and WinForms and WinUI. We'll, we'll talk about all of that. So that's coming up today. Uh, next week, we have uh, January 31st, we have all things JavaScript. So that's our... Uh, Kenda UI folks who are going to talk about Angular and jQuery and React and Vue, so you can build your modern web apps however you want, and uh, we can, you know, light up with our UI uh, irrespective of the framework that you're coming in as. And then uh, we kind of close off next week with, uh, uh, you know, another webinar on productivity, and these are some things that are critical to your enterprise workflows, uh, things like reporting, ChessMock, and Fiddler. Uh, everyone loves Fiddler, so we'll talk about that. Uh, so if you are new to the family, welcome. If you are using our products, uh, hopefully you can see that we are doing uh, as much as we can every release. This was a particularly big release for us. Uh, a lot of things we, you know, changed around internally to make sure we are, you know, able to give you as much of, you know, productivity uh, as we uh, as we can do. Um, all right. So uh, you are giving us, you know, a precious amount of your day. So let's make this count. Um, if for some reason anything happens to your stream, you can, you know, always, uh, you know, catch this. Uh, we are recording this. We'll put it up on YouTube as soon as we can. While you do see just Ed and me on screen, we do have a small army of folks uh, supporting us mm -hmm. for this webinar. These are actually the engineers who build the products that you love and care. Uh, so ask a few questions. There's a Q&A panel uh, on the webinar window, so we will try to answer as many questions as we can during the webinar. Um, if there are particular questions that are relevant to everyone, we, I mean, Ed and me are going to, you know, read them out. Uh, so, you know, let's make this count. And if you're on socials, you know, uh, use the hashtag uh, so we can, you know, have a breadcrumb trail and, you know, keep answering your questions. Uh, but the bottom line is, it's a big release. Uh, give it a spin. Uh, maybe you're using some parts of our control set. Maybe some of the things that we show you today uh, are going to be of interest based on whatever you're doing. Uh, we are here uh, for you. So, like I said, it's a big release and we have tried to be, you know, um, giving you things that are engaging for your users, making things you are inclusive, uh, you know, uh, keeping design in mind, uh, keeping accessibility in mind. And uh, it's a, you know, big portfolio of products and everything is up on blogs.tillery.com. All of the teams take time to write up exactly what's new. Uh, like I said, always look around. Uh, you might be, you know, having our DevCraft license uh, bundle, which includes everything. So maybe something else uh, that catches your attention today is going to be helpful to you. So uh, please take a look. And everything that we show you today uh, are the latest bits. Uh, so if you're not seeing them, uh, it's probably because you don't have the bits. So however you go and get our bits, uh, you know, many of you go 
to the download section on Teleric.com and get the bits. Maybe you use, you know, the control panel, or maybe you just go to, you know, NuGet or NPM to get your bits, uh, go and update the bits, and that's and that's how you're going to see uh, some, some of the functionality light up that we're going to you know, talk about today. And uh, since today is .NET, I think it's uh, you know just good to take a step back and talk about .NET overall, where things are. So uh, we have had a you know long journey from .NET Framework to .NET Core 3.1, 5, 6. Uh, so 6 came out last year, and you saw all of, you know all of last year us you know supporting you with .NET 6. .NET 7 is out as of last November, and you know we are here to tell you that we are you know supporting the latest and greatest. If you want to do .NET 7. Uh, you know, have at it. All, you, know, you can take all of our, you know, desktop, uh, you know, uh, apps and run them on the latest .NETs. Uh, but if you are going to stay on .NET Framework, nothing wrong with that. We are still here to support you. Uh, so however you want to play it uh, with modern .NET for, you know, it's truly a unified stack. And hopefully you see like our UI, you know, components kind of, you know, gel with that. Uh, uh, you know, it's a, you know, unified API uh, stack that we have. So developers, you know, you use one, the other ones feel familiar. Uh, so, however, is uh, you know, is your tool set uh, Visual Studio family, uh, Windows or Mac? We are here to help. So, that's the ecosystem that we are you know coming into, and we genuinely care about your experience. Uh, we are all about you know developer productivity. If uh, something is a pain, please don't you know uh, suffer yourself. Uh, just tell us about it. Uh, you have the forum, you have the tickets, uh, and you have all of the demos to check out that we're going to show you today. Uh, and if you are you know, really wanting something to happen, uh, talk to us. Uh, feedback our folks, you know, look at that a lot. So we, we are trying to prioritize what the roadmap looks like. So, you know, that's it. We we care a lot. So you know, talk to us about anything that we can help with. And with that, um, I think we are ready for Ed to take us through all things web. But before Ed kind of gets into all the web goodness, we do have a quick poll question for you. We want to make this interactive. So we want to know what you are doing and uh, where we can come in to help. Um, so let's do a quick poll and see where you folks are. All right, so uh, we'll we'll give you a minute here uh, before we start uh, to you know respond. But you know you can do the web stuff with uh, you know a lot of different ways uh, in in the ASP.NET land. Are you doing core? Are you doing MVC? Are you doing web forms? Or are you doing Blazor? Um, so tell us where you are, and hopefully you'll see that Ed um, and the team trying to help you out, no matter what type of app you're building. Yeah, we get a lot of options these days, Sam. Yeah, for sure. You know, flexibility and choices are uh, good things for developers. We, we like that. All right, so folks, uh, tell us where you are. Um, going once, going twice, and ta-da! Let's let's see where you all folks are. Oh, look at that! This is gonna make uh, Ed oh, very wow. happy because he loves Blazor. But you know, it's it's good to know like the reality is a lot of ASP.NET Core and MVC as well. Um, so uh, that that's all good to know. So that being yeah, said, hopefully. Ed. Hopefully folks were paying attention to uh, Steve Sanderson uh, earlier this week. I think it was Monday. He was talking about the roadmap for .NET 8. And there's a lot of stuff in Blazor and .NET 8 coming. So we're, we're going to see a lot more uh, Blazor in our futures. Absolutely. All right. So Ed, with that, why don't you take over? Uh, I'm going to quickly change over to your uh, screen. And Absolutely. show us all the web goodness. All right. So let's talk about all things web. Um, I'm going to talk about all the things that are in the dot Telerik UI for uh, the web, and that would be Ajax and ASP.NET and VC and Core and Blazor. Um, if you're interested in the uh, Kendo UI products, Angular, React, Vue.js, jQuery, those things, we do have another webinar uh, with some fine folks that are going to present on all of those uh, topics. So we're going to focus on all the .NET front-end UI stuff today. Um, across all of those products, we've been working hard on accessibility improvements. So you'll see that common across all of the libraries there. Uh, so we're trying to get those aligned with the WCAG guidelines and so on. So a lot of improvements coming there. Uh, we're also looking at security compliance. So there's security compliance improvements um, across multiple products as well. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, document processing libraries, uh, we, we call that the DPL, document processing libraries. Uh, those cross over all of the products, Sam's products as well, and uh, there are updates with those DPL libraries that are uh, nice features to have. Um, then we'll talk about Ajax, good old web forms. 
uh, MVC and core, uh, usually bundle those together because a lot of the features cross over from one to the other. And then we'll talk about Blazor and Theme Builder Pro. Uh, start off by saying all of the, the uh, products that you would expect to support .NET Core um, are, have zero day support for .NET 7. So we're talking about Telerik UI for ASP.NET Core and Blazor there. So those had uh, out of the box day zero support for .NET 7. Um, I talked about accessibility. So we're talking keyboard navigation, uh, ARIA, Section 508, WCAG 2.1. Uh, we are enhancing all of our libraries to meet those standards. And this is like a continual effort with every single one of our UI libraries to make sure we're giving you the best accessibility experience possible. Uh, I mentioned security, so CSP compliance. Um, this is uh, if you want to put your application to run uh, under strict mode, um, the best thing to do is go to docs.telerik.com and look under the content security policy section for the library that you're using. And you can see in there uh, what standards each of the libraries meet. They do vary a little bit library to library, um, but in there you can see um, how they meet the criteria for this uh, CSP compliance. Um, and they explain to you whether whether or not they are still using any of these uh, on safe eval or inline functionalities and whether you have to uh, put in any uh, exclusions for those or not, but we're working towards getting all of the libraries where they do meet CSP compliance fully, and you don't need any of those exceptions. So take a look at docs.telerk.com, check under that security policy section, um, and you'll see how to set each of those libraries up to work with uh, the uh, security policy modes. Um, document processing libraries got some updates here. We got a uh, new table of contents in RadWords processing. There's a brand new search API, which is really nice because you can search through uh, the DOM of your RAD processing document and find text within the document. And that will give you back not only the text where it is located, but the page it's located on as well. So you can do some modifications or whatever your needs are for finding and replacing text um, inside of your documents. Uh, there's also some new encryption modes supported within the uh, RAD PDF processing library. So you can save those out encrypted with passwords um, and you can set roles and, and et cetera for those. So make sure you check out the docs for the document processing libraries for those new features. Now we're gonna jump into the specific libraries here. Uh, so we're, we're gonna start off with um, one of the uh, longest running libraries that we have, the tried and true ASP.NET web forms, or AJAX as we like to call it. So in Telerik UI for ASP.NET AJAX, uh, we have a brand new signature component. Um, so this, we'll talk a little bit more in detail about that in a minute, uh, but this is um, a UI component you, you've seen on some of our other libraries as well, where you can use um, a pen or a touch screen or just your mouse to uh, write a signature. This is really great for apps um, or you're, you're trying to capture like a user signature for something and approval, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, we've got a brand new uh, set of settings for our drop down boxes. Uh, search box has some new events. And of course, those accessibility improvements that I mentioned. Uh, the new signature component, and this of course comes with customizations where you can customize the size of the, the uh, signature box itself, um, the border radius, the, the line colors and the line size of the signature itself. So that brush stroke that you get when you sign something through the signature component um, in the fill mode. So all of these things, uh, like many of our components, uh, has that customization feature to it. Uh, the Ajax dropdown list, we, we added a new property here for a dropdown auto width. So the normal behavior uh, without this setting turned on is that uh, items that are past the size of the uh, width of that box will start to wrap. And maybe that's not the best user experience for your users. So we added in a property to optionally set this to auto width. So it'll find the largest item within the dropdown list and expand the width of the dropdown list so those items don't wrap. 
And then of course, uh, accessibility improvements, uh, just outlining some of the specific components here. There's quite a few, the grid, the scheduler, lots of the combo and dropdown boxes, uh, all of our inputs, uh, cloud upload and media player. Um, those got accessibility improvements to bring those in lines with the WCHE guidelines and up to level AAA. So let's jump out into the browser for just a moment and take a look at that signature component in action. Uh, you can find all of these demos at demos.telerik.com. That'll hit the top level page of all the products that you can see the demos online for. Um, and you just click on the individual product that you'd like to visit and see the demos for. So I've got the ASP.NET Ajax product up here. And what's nice is we have highlighted some of the updates and new items here with these nice green badges. So if we uh, take a look here, you'll see these badges that sit next to the components that have been either updated or brand new. And we've got our brand new signature component here. Now I'm only using a mouse on a, on a desk here at the, at the, uh, um, the hotel that I'm in. So this isn't gonna be the best signature ever, but we'll, we'll give it our best shot. And um, you can see here too, we can change the uh, brush color and the width of that as well. we'll Talk about the background. So we've got full control of how this looks and feels. Uh, we can also clear that out with a quick, quick, quick click of the button. Um, and this is, an, again, nice component. If you have like a process at work that requires some, some sort of signature at the end, maybe you're, uh, you've got some form that needs a uh, signature on, uh, that last step there to, to make sure that the, the user has their actual signature on it. Uh, so this is one of those higher, highly requested components that uh, we get asked for from customers. And now you have it here in ASP.NET Ajax. So also we've got uh, that update to the dropdown list. We can take a quick look at that as well. It's a nice quick demo here. So the uh, traditional behavior of the dropdown list, you can see it's kind of matching right here the the width of uh, this component here. And there are some items in here. If we look, it's easier to see when something's highlighted that it's wrapping, but as you're scrolling through, it doesn't necessarily always look like that is one line. It could be two items there. So to make that just a little bit easier to see, we can enable this drop down to auto width, and now it's expanded the box out and none of those items are wrapping anymore. It makes it just a tad bit easier to scroll through uh, for that end user there. So that is our updates for the Ajax libraries. Now we're gonna move into ASP.NET Core and ASP.NET MVC. Um, again, I traditionally I just bundle these together. There are some um, small nuances between the two libraries, like ASP.NET Core has some of the core features that you get from that framework. So in ASP.NET Core, you get tag helpers along with the HTML helpers here. So you'll see the those two options in the demos as well. And if you're not familiar with those, you can toggle between the two and compare the two syntax with each other, see which one you like best. Uh, so overall, we've got some new components here. Uh, we've got the duration uh, picker component. It's a brand new UI component that helps you select uh, time, um, time spans. Uh, we have a grid layout and stack panel component. I'll explain more in detail what these are when we get to them. Uh, chip and chip list. These are our nice little uh, components um, for doing, uh, it's kind of like a pill shaped thing that you can uh, set up uh, lists of items with and, and make uh, UI selections and things like that. Uh, floating labels on inputs. Uh, so if you have an input, yeah, there's a, uh, like a prompt inside that ends up being the label that floats up to the top. We'll take a look at those. Uh, we've got some nice chart improvements. There's a brand new Fluent uh, app demo. So we have this Fluent theme that was just released in the past uh, R3 release of last year. Um, it's a, a nice looking theme that is built for accessibility, comes from the Microsoft Fluent um, design language. Uh, so we have a brand new app that really showcases that theme. Uh, so we'll take a look at that as well. There's been some improvements with how we do modules in these frameworks. 
Uh, so the JavaScript that supports the Telerik UI for MVC and Core, that Kendo UI uh, JavaScript library, there's some new uh, ECMAScript module support there that we can talk about. Uh, we're also waving goodbye to less. So this is officially the last release that will support the less theme uh, or CSS precompiler uh, for our themes. So uh, if you're using less, uh, just a heads up, this is going to be the last release where that is supported. Uh, we're moving towards SAS and um, supporting SAS through our theme builder product. Uh, we've added some localization resource files. Uh, so this is a, a nice uh, value add. Um, so there's, uh, I think, 96 uh, mappings of, or sorry, 96 languages that we mapped uh, to different components. Uh, so we, we pulled those resources in for you to have available uh, in the library there. Uh, and then, of course, accessibility improvements across the board. Uh, so the duration picker, uh, there are options to add customizable buttons here for the quick shortcuts. And so if you want to set up certain intervals for users to just be able to click on those buttons and autofill uh, the, the data on the duration time picker, you can do that. There are also uh, multiple columns of data that you can put into the, the duration picker. So we've got days, hours, minutes, seconds, and milliseconds that you can use here. And it's optional. You can turn on or off the columns that you would like to display to the user and have them be able to set. Uh, grid layout and stack layout. So this is one that we got a request for pretty heavily in the Blazor world, and it's made its way into MVC and Core now as well. Uh, people seem to really like the idea of this. And what it is, we've taken the grid layout and the Flexbox layout concepts from CSS and kind of express those as components inside of your ASP.NET Core and MVC frameworks. So you can use HTML helpers or tag helpers in Core to describe your layouts without having to touch CSS. And this is really nice for context switching. So uh, you're already inside of your HTML and uh, you're already writing you know, tag helpers or HTML helpers and you want to write a layout you don't have to jump out into CSS and write CSS code. You can just put that in along with the rest of your components that are written in that same syntax. So uh, this is something that's really important to folks. And now you have it here in MVC and Core. Uh, the chip list and uh, the chip components. And these are really simple components that give you a lot of bang for their buck. So there's a lot of uh, you know tag lists and um, uh, you can annotate uh, labels on data, things like that. Um, and then they have additional icons and other customizations that you can do to really add a lot of value to a particular UI component that you're building. So we have the chip so that is the standalone chip item, or you can just bind those to a list. Uh, so it's got that, that list behavior automatically built in. So you just data bind to that thing and uh, display it there on the screen. Um, floating labels, nice UI concept. Uh, it keeps uh, the labels inside of the input until they're being used. And you can find that across multiple, multiple inputs here. Uh, you can see our drop downs, combo boxes, select lists, auto completes, and so on. All of our pickers um, now have this behavior. Even the brand new uh, duration time picker has this feature. We've got a new demo that you can find that integrates the document processing capabilities um, with our signature component. Now you saw the signature component was brand new in Ajax. We released that, I think it was last release uh, for ASP, not ASP.NET Core and MVC. Um, and now we've got a integration point here where we can show you how to take that um, signature and place it inside of an existing PDF file. And that demo is up on the website where you can just try it out or check out the source code to see how we did it. We'll take a look at that in just a moment. Uh, charts. Uh, the charts got enhancements. Uh, we've got labels in our bullet charts and subtitle support on all the charts. So all the charts getting a, a little bit of a, a new feature there. 
that's nice to have. And then we've got another brand new demo for you. This is a whole application. So that one I talked about our eShop demo that plays off of the Fluent UI theme that we have now. Uh, so we'll deep dive into that in just a minute here. So let's take a look at our demos page again. Hey, Ed, uh, yes. while, while you're switching, just a quick question here from the chat room. Lauren was asking, like, uh, you, you showed off how things that are updated, controls that are updated, have the new label or an updated label. Is there anything that uh, else that changes you exactly what changed that, that are highlighted? Um, yeah, so if we jump into the overview again here, uh, let's, let's go over to demos. Sorry, demos. There we go, that's what I wanted, the top level. Uh, you can see inside of here, uh, those updated levels, there's quite a few of them inside of uh, the ASP.NET Core and MVC products here. Um, we've got those brand new grid and stack layouts, and then we've got the updates. And the question is, uh, which, which features are updated? You can see there's an updated tag on those specific features as well. Sometimes there's multiple in here, so keep your eye out um, in some of the, the uh, larger, more complex components like the data grid, uh, you might see several um, ch uh, children underneath of there. So you might need to expand some of the uh, menus out to see them all. Uh, so if we go, there aren't any under grid this time around, but you can see there's data binding, exporting, data editing, and so on. So you look for those labels inside of these these child categories as well. So you might need to scroll through some of these, but there are indicators. Um, on each of those items. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, and folks are excited. They're you know getting ahead uh, to Blazor, which I'm sure you'll get to. Yes, we'll be we'll be talking about Blazor in just a second. There's so many good things going on here in ASP.NET Core uh, this time around. Uh, we we've got to dedicate some time to these brand new uh, components and updates that we got. Uh, so this is the uh, duration time picker here. Uh, so under the duration here, you can see we've got um, the uh, hours and minutes that we can select through these um, these dials here, um, or we can just click on one hour, and that will give us um, a you know a direct input. We could also do an hour and 30 minutes, and these are customizable. So if you wanted an hour and 15 minutes, you could add that button. Uh, to this list or, or replace one of the buttons if you like. Uh, so these are customizable buttons that help you uh, make things easier for your user uh, to set these without having to scroll through each item. So those are handy there. You see this one's only got minutes on it and there's no shortcuts for this one. So you can disable that feature as well if you need to. Uh, so this lets you just scroll right on through and select what you need. Uh, so again, you can uh, select the columns that you want to see here. You can go all the way down to milliseconds. You go up to days here. Uh, there's those shortcuts. If you want to see how to edit the code for those, you just jump right in here to view source code. And in here is where you'll see the difference between, I mentioned, uh, let's see here, my, my zoom is, there we go. We've got HTML helper or tag helper up here at the top. So if you click on these tabs here, you'll toggle between the two syntax that are available in ASP.NET Core. So if I come up here and click on tag helper, you see this is a more component style or uh, tag and attribute style of declaring your components. Let's try to zoom in just a little bit there so we can see a bit better. And we've got our Kendo uh, time duration picker. Uh, you can set your separator here. And then here's your shortcuts being defined. Uh, so you've got an array of shortcuts that you can declare here. And here's where you can customize their text and the value for each of those items. And again, you can add and remove items as you need from this list when you decide which one of those inputs is more common and useful to your users. So you can make the UX of your app much, much better. Uh, so that's the uh, duration time picker. And then uh, let me zoom out again so we can see everything all at once here. Uh, we've got our grid layout and stack layout component. Let's jump into the grid layout component because grid and stack are very similar. So stack is going to give you 
um, items that don't necessarily need an alignment um, when you have or alignment in multiple columns. It's more of a repeating list. So uh, the stack gives you a vertical or horizontal list that repeats. Uh, the grid gives you two dimensions of, uh, of this list where you can have items in columns and rows. Uh, so they're very similar in regards of they both do layouts. They both kind of handle how the items are placed a little differently. Uh, the grid is uh, one that is really helpful here. Look at the tag helpers. They're just a little bit easier uh, to read, in my opinion. I do a lot of work with uh, Blazor and HTML, uh, so the, the tag and attribute style of writing these really helps. Um, so instead of jumping over into CSS, uh, what's nice is we can stay within our tag helper syntax here, and we can say, I want a kendo grid, and the grid layout, I can define how many rows I want it to have and the individual height of each of those rows, uh, if we'd like to set a specific height to those. So our, our grid um, rows get defined, and then we have three columns here as well. So our rows and our columns are defined. Um, you don't have to explicitly set these heights if you don't want to, uh, those are optional. And then of course we can do the same with columns here. So we have three columns, and we have six rows in here. And then once we have the rows defined and the rows and columns defined, uh, we can just put in our grid items. So we have our grid layout items and then our grid items go inside of there. Uh, and once we have that set up and the data, uh, oops, data gets put into those grid items, uh, they get laid out nicely into the format that we gave it. So here's our, our three by six grid here. You see the three items across. Uh, this is one item. So you can see each of those getting laid out individually here. And then as we get down into the further rows, you can see those heights, those different grid heights kick in uh, for the recommended items here. And of course you can span those grid items too across multiple rows. There's a uh, total customization there. Um, very similar to what you'd see in CSS grid. Um, it's just we're flipping this over to the markup side. So you can do it right from components instead of jumping into CSS. And then of course the uh, slightly simpler stack layout. Um, so we've got some cards here that are are being uh, laid out in a horizontal fashion. We could also switch that up to vertical, which is nice, especially if you're working on uh, something that is responsive, you want it to go from desktop to mobile. Um, this is super nice. You can put a flag in here uh, that will swap those. And when you switch to a mobile device, there's even a demo of that inside of the grid layout under this adaptive example. So you can check out the source code for that one. But as the size, of this changes, we'll change the number of columns and rows that you're showing here. So you can use that example on uh, either of those layout types. Uh, we've also got our chip and chip list. I'll jump straight into chip list because chip list is just a list of those chips that you'd see. And uh, what's a notable thing here is we have an icon section of the chip. So you can see the check mark in there and we can toggle that even as the items are selected and you can put whatever icon you like inside of that icon. Um, and then you can bind your data to these lists as well. You can make uh, you know, multi-select scenarios, all sorts of different things. Um, they can be read only, they can be selectable, you can enable, disable, lots of options there. Of course, you can change the appearance like you can uh, almost anything inside of uh, our, our Telerik UI libraries. So we've got uh, things like our, our fill mode, border radius, uh, the success theme colors, uh, error colors, and so on. Uh, you can add those in and uh, adjust things as you need them. Uh, so that's, um, that is most of the ASP.NET Core stuff. Um, one more thing I wanted to look at here before we move on to Blazor, uh, that was the integration with uh, the signature. So here's that signature component that I just highlighted for uh, Ajax. But this is our MVC and Core version. And I can put a signature in here. Um, if I go down to the brand new uh, demo that we've got here, 
This shows that integration with our document processing and a PDF file. So uh, we can add our signature here. And uh, boy, I butchered that one really bad. Let me clear that, clear that out. Come on, I can do, I can do better. I can do better. There we go. Place our signature, and it's going to lift that out as an SVG and put that inside of the document uh, using our, our DPL there. Uh, along with that is our brand new eShop demo. This is at the top of the demos page. You can click right on it. It'll jump into the demo for you. Uh, you can also download the source code for this and modify it to meet your own application's needs. But uh, this is a, a virtual bike shop that you can uh, see with lots of different components from our libraries in it. So we've got menu components, list components, um, our card components, uh, all sorts of different buttons. Uh, there's multiple pages inside of here uh, that do multiple things. We've got a, a nice uh, login example here. Click login, you get to the home page. There's a carousel component, uh, shows you how to use that. Uh, whoops, I clicked as I was trying to scroll there. Uh, but we've got multiple ways of showing off uh, many of our components in here. And it's a really great example of the clean uh, UI that the uh, Fluent UI theme brings. Um, and you can see it's got that kind of Microsoft inspired um, Fluent UI look to it. So make sure you check that out, see the source code for it, play around with it, uh, modify it, make it your own. Ed, is this new? This is brand new. Oh, nice. Uh, I really so, like it. Yeah, the Fluent theme came out uh, last release. So the Fluent theme is, is pretty new. Uh, so this is a, a, a demo that just really highlights that. And not only that, but a lot of our components as well. So Sam, if you jump over to uh, the Telerik UI for ASP.NET Core demos page, it's going to be right here inside of the sample applications uh, section on the screen. Just can't run that sample and uh, there's a sample for you. Um, now, if you want to download source code for this, uh, the, the source code uh, for our demos is inside the installer for one. Uh, so you can just, uh, as you're installing your, your, your updates for this in control panel, just check the box that says uh, to install local demos and you'll, you'll get that demo installed uh, right there with your tools. All right, so everybody's favorite here. We're gonna talk about Blazor for the next few minutes. Um, so and, and before you switch switch yeah. gears to Blazor, can I ask you a quick question here? Because like Ben in the chat room was asking uh, an important thing here. Oh, and by the mm -hmm. way, Ben has been using our grids since 2013. Thank you for that. Uh, we have been wow. known for our grids and charts. Uh, but when you talk about you know all of these platforms for you know modern web, uh, what .dot nets do they kind of go in uh, go with? Because like as folks try to upgrade their bits, when you are in .dot net framework, uh, you know 4.8 or 4.7, are you talking? fundamentally Ajax and MVC, correct? Yes. Okay. So you're going to have Ajax and MVC. Um, if you want to upgrade and get um, uh, tag helpers, um, you're going to need to get up to ASP.NET Core. Um, and then for Blazor, you need Core as well. So uh, ASP.NET, or sorry, Blazor's been on since uh, ASP.NET Core 3.0. Okay. So you need 3.0 and above to use Blazor. If you want to really use it well with our components, I would recommend uh, ASP.NET 5 and higher. I think uh, support for um, ASP.NET Core, we're, we're at uh, 6 is um, LTS, right, Sam? Did I get that right? 6 is LTS? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah so you probably want to be on 6. I would recommend getting up to, to ASP.NET Core 6 if you want to use Blazor. Um, so with Blazor, we've got the uh, signature component, which you, you saw uh, multiple times already. We've also got the avatar component. Uh, so this is a nice, uh, simple UI component. Uh, takes uh, an image or some text, puts it in a, a nice, uh, familiar UI for folks. Um, and you could control how that avatar is displayed. These can be rectangular, they can be circles, you can set rounded edges and so on. Uh, so that's a, a handy one. The chip component, which we also saw in MVC and Core, we have that in Blazor as well now. Uh, we have new icon components in Blazor. So we've added 
SVG icons to the library. And with that, we've added brand new components that support uh, both font icons and SVG icons. Um, so there's some nuances between the two. Um, the, the font icons are, are pretty easy to use and scalable. Uh, SVG icons are a little bit better at scaling. Uh, font icons scale pretty well, but SVG uh, icons scale uh, indefinitely better. So they're, they're going to be way more crisp uh, as you scale those up uh, or down even. Um, and then with SVG icons, you can do a little bit more customization um, through uh, the, the fill paths and whatnot through CSS. So there's some additional benefits there of the SVG icons, and now we're offering both. Um, and you can also set these globally, so you can go into your root component, your Telerik root component, and you can set a preference of which icon type you would like to display in the entire application. So if you'd like all of the icons to be SVG icons, you can toggle that one on or off inside of your Telerik root component, which is really cool. Brand new in this release is an update to our grid. So data grid has a brand new sizing option. You're going to see those sizing options in many of our components, uh, but this one in particular uh, on the uh, the grid, when you set the size to small, you get the brand new compact grid. So if you need to show a lot of data in a very tight space, this is the feature that you need. So you just set the size here to small, and you're going to get that compact view. Uh, so I know a lot of a lot of you folks in financial services, uh, you've got all that data on the screen to show. Uh, this one's for you. Um, We've also got the ability here in the grid to change the position of our um, our pager component. So the pager component, uh, currently you see it here on the bottom. I'll show you in a demo here. We can flip that up to the top now, uh, really simple and easy. Adaptive rendering. This is this is a feature that I really love. Uh, a lot of a lot of time and work went into this one. Um, this is so you can use more of your components in a mobile setting. And this is going to be super important as we start looking more at uh, doing hybrid applications with .NET MAUI, or maybe if you just want your website to scale better down to mobile devices and be accessible as a web app um, from, from mobile. Uh, so what this does is if you set the adaptive rendering to auto on your components, um, when you're on a small device, the framework will detect that and display a mobile-friendly UI. So this is taking and, and adapting that UI to uh, be more touch-friendly, fit better on a small screen, um, and just make that UX uh, so much better on a mobile device. So take a look at the adaptive rendering on uh, the components that are listed here. You've got lots of your inputs here. Um, there's some that, that aren't listed here because we, we did some of the adaptive rendering in the last release as well. So there's quite a few components now that support this. Uh, our combo boxes, drop-down lists, auto-completes, lots of your inputs there have support for this. Uh, we'll take a quick look at that as well. Now, this is this is good stuff, Ed, because I think uh, in the chat room, Pascal was asking about you know, adaptive rendering. So we are very conscious of you know, different devices that you want to render this on. And um, uh, there was also a question about how does all of the Blazor component work with, uh, you know, on mobile or desktop devices with Dr. Maui. So hold on uh, for just a little bit. Since you asked, I, I wasn't planning on, but I will, I will try to show you some of this. But it's, it's, all, it's good news all the way around. Yeah, excellent. Looking forward to seeing that. Uh, so... There's even more components that got updates. Um, we've got our radio button uh, shown here that has a brand new template feature. Uh, Forms got an on update event. So uh, you've got you know your on success, on fail. Now we've got on update. So if you change any of the form elements within that form, you're going to get a event that pops for those. Uh, date and time. Uh, components have been enhanced. We've got lots of um, detailed enhancements here that you should go look at individually um, if you're using any of our date and time uh, components. Um, there, there's just too many features to, to demo out for this today, but we've got like auto tabbing, copy and paste, which is a big one, um, two digit, di digit year max, uh, we've got auto correct 
parts in auto caret mode. Uh, so those are kind of nuanced things where you're you're typing in, maybe you're hitting like a colon to go to the next field. It's gonna it's gonna help you auto uh, traverse that that input. Uh, so those are super handy things to have. Um, more updated components. Uh, a lot of components already have this, and more have gotten a uh, no data template. So no data templates, if you're familiar with the term empty states, so you have a data bound component of some kind and there's no data available yet. Maybe uh, it hasn't been created, it's not available at that time. What you don't want to do is leave an empty box there for users guessing as to why it's empty or what should go in it. Uh, so no data templates give you that space where you can define uh, maybe a pop-up dialog or something that says, uh, you know, data will be shown here once it's entered in this form or, you know, whatever that custom message is that you want to set uh, and gives the, the user some cues to go maybe entered in somewhere else or maybe they should uh, refresh something to, you know, see that data show up. Uh, so this gives you that option. I uh, highly recommend using these no data templates to make your UX better. Uh, tree view got uh, a new on item render um, event and cal calendar and date time pickers have this week number uh, that you can show on the calendar. You can see those uh, on the left hand side, left hand side of this calendar here and folks in finance, I'm pointing at you, That that's that's something that uh, I'm sure will come in handy for you. I've done some finance work myself. I know how much our, your finance folks like to see um, those features. Um, while we're talking about Teller QI for Blazor, we have to mention uh, the Blazor REPL. So Blazor REPL is a real-time editor that works in the browser. You can share code snippets, you can debug things, um, you can pair program with people by sharing uh, your, you know, your demo with them and get feedback from them. Uh, one of the things that is just essential to a tool like this is being able to save a list of all of the demos that you've made inside the Blazor REPL. So that feature is here now. So make sure you go out to blazorrepl.telerk.com. And if you don't have a Telerk uh, account already, you can set up a free one. So click in the upper right hand corner, log in with that account, and you can start saving your snippets in Telerik REPL for Blazor. So with that said, Sam, let's jump out uh, to the web one more time, and let's take a look at a few of these items. I know we're running close on time here, so I'll go quickly. I, I, can, feel, I can feel you trembling in the background as I look over at my clock, Sam. I've got just about yeah, 10 more minutes good. here, uh, but we, we're, we're good. We'll, we'll get this done. Um, but we already saw uh, some of these, like the chip and chip list um, in the other libraries. They're very similar here, so we don't need to really go into too much detail on them. The syntax for creating them is slightly different from framework to framework, but the functionality of the components is generally the same. We've got our chips here. Uh, we've got those um, easy interactions. I like some of the demos we've got here as well. Like these show you kind of um, a, a list of people that you're adding to an email. You can add and remove those items and this one's actually disabled so we can't remove all of them. Uh, we've got appearance demos in here so you can um, set you know disabled state, the fill mode and so on. And see how those parameters affect your component. And then again chip list is simply uh, a list of those chip components. So you have that at your disposal as well. Uh, let's take a look at the data grid, because I know that's a big one that a lot of people are using. You said somebody was using this back in 2013, was it? So uh, this is the, the Blazor version of that data grid. And again, as we scroll down, uh, we had a question here earlier about how do you know what's new and what's not. Uh, you can see those new tabs or bullets uh, right next to the, the sizing option there. And here you got a side-by-side -side comparison with um, the, the size of that data grid. Uh, so this is the compact one on the left. We've got the normal size one on the right. And uh, let's see, I was looking for the pager position. Uh, that one 
isn't highlighted on the side here, so I'm, I'm missing that one. I'll skip past that for now, but you can move uh, the the pager component up to the top with a flag um, to set that on top now. Um, and if you want to check out the source for any of these, uh, you can view source here and, and view it uh, you know, right in the page, or you can actually bounce out to Blazor REPL, and you can run that actual demo in your own Blazor REPL, make modifications to it, and then save it out and share it. So if you want to add something to it, put your own spin on that demo, uh, share it with somebody on your team, tweet it out on the internet, embed it in a blog, uh, you can do that by clicking share up here. And you get this nice little share uh, URL that pops up. Take note of the, the, G, the GUID that you get at the end of this URL, because that's going to show up over here on the right-hand side, or left-hand side, in our user snippets. So now that I've shared it, uh, that latest one has come up right here. See the, the GUID in that frame. Um, I can come over here and name this one, and uh, maybe this is Ed's uh, grid demo. So now when I want to go back to this demo after I've made changes to it, I can come back and find it and load it right up there in the panel. Maybe uh, I can save it to share it out later, um, so on. So, so that's, Ed, that's a huge feature there. Quick question yes. uh, while you're on the REPL. Because uh, I have folks in the chat room and Q&A panel, uh, they're, they're fans of REPL, uh, which uh, I you know, understand it's super convenient and you know, very productive. Uh, Pascal was asking, like, once you start working on these REPLs, is there a way to, you know, um, you know, split this out in a project or would you, you know, rather be, you know, moving the code over? Uh, so currently you're going to want to uh, copy and paste this back into a project if you want to continue working on it inside of Visual Studio. Um, if you have something in Visual Studio that you want to push up to REPL, now that's very easy. There's actually a plugin that you get when you install the components, or you can go to the Visual Studio Marketplace and download um, the Telerik UI for Blazor uh, plugin for Visual Studio and Visual Studio Code. You can highlight a section of code and right-click Publish to Blazor REPL, and it will take that code and paste it right into Blazor REPL for you. Uh, as far as getting the code out, I think that is in our feature request section already. Um, so if you visit uh, the uh, feedback.telerik.com, scroll through there and hit an upvote if you're interested in that. Um, I believe there's one in there for saving the project back out to like a solution file or, or something that uh, Visual Studio, some, you know, just a, uh, save it to uh, a zip file or something that Visual Studio or Visual Studio Code can consume. So I think that's on um, the suggestion list, but it hasn't been um, in uh, our, our folks in chat or um, in the back office here can correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think that is on a roadmap just yet, but you can help us get it there. Uh, with uh, yeah, up. and I mean, it, it can also be tricky because you know there are dependencies that you're you know bringing back and forth. But uh, you know, good to get one. Yeah, but it's a great suggestion, and um, I think it's something that we'll we'll see people want to have in the future. All right, so uh, we've got um, again lots of updates here. Um, let's show off just one more of these before. Uh, we move things on. I want to show off one of those uh, adaptive examples here. And uh, right now you can see we have, we've got this drop down box. Um, and this wouldn't be as user friendly on a mobile device. But if we pop into our dev tools here, uh, we can tell this to kind of emulate an iPhone XR here. And we'll, we'll go ahead and refresh the page. And let's see if uh, we're able to do this in the browser without having to pull out our phone here. There we go. So now when we click on the drop down or tap it with our finger, uh, we get a nice uh, user interface here of all of the items. And I can tap and scroll uh, through all of those. And if I select something, it's going to automatically drop that box down for me. So that's a, a much nicer experience than having to try to, to touch the uh, small uh, drop down on a mobile device if you're just you know trying to thumb through this uh, as a as a desktop style drop down. So you'll find that uh, look for all those updated icons 
Um, there's, again, this one already had it. There's multiple components, input components that, um, that have gotten it as well in this release. Uh, and then finally, uh, before I wrap up, I just want to give a quick mention to Theme Builder and Theme Builder Pro. Uh, so in those, you'll see uh, support for Theme Build or for the Fluent theme that was used to build that um, other demo that we saw earlier. So that is available as a theme in Theme Builder. And you can customize that um, as well. And there, uh, for Theme Builder Pro, there are custom metric variables, custom font, and custom icon um, uh, features in there as well. So if you're looking at building themes for your application, check out Theme Builder and Theme Builder Pro. Theme Builder Pro is going to give you more granular control over those components. Uh, this is a quick demo that I did when .NET 7 was released, where I went to the .NET 7 website and kind of copied their theme um, into Theme Builder Pro. So uh, you can see I've got that hot pink and magenta uh, and that purple color uh, theme going with all of our Teller UI for Blazor components here. And uh, we get this nice live preview that we can edit inside of. Um, you can see I've got all of my colors defined over here on the left. And uh, again, we've got support for custom variables inside of there as well. So I can click up here and add a variable. So what this is kind of like, um, this is similar to like a WYSIWYG editor for SAS, which is really neat. Um, so this, this will help you build out those themes. And if you've got Theme Builder Pro, you can bounce over to the advanced edit here. And this is going to let you zoom in to the individual components and get all of the uh, properties that are inside of those components and edit the look and feel. Maybe you want to edit the border radius just for this one top or bottom of uh, a button. Maybe just one corner. Who knows? Uh, you can do all that by just going in uh, to the uh, properties on the right hand side here um, and and tweaking some of the values uh, for each of these. So that, that is how I made the, the .NET 7 theme come alive with our, our Teller UI for Blazor components. So jump into Theme Builder and check that out. And I, that should do it for my time, Sam. It's gonna be back to you, my friend. You know, this is this is good stuff. Uh, you know, a lot of talking for you, but you know, uh, Ed and me are uh, we have a tough job. Uh, you know, somebody in the chat room was saying like we should you know focus on individual frameworks at a time, but you know we are also respectful of your time. So we are you know literally standing on the shoulder of giants and our engineering teams who put all of this together, and then we are trying to do justice to all of them. But I like all the theme builder stuff. I mean, we are you know telling the story better and better every day, like the developer and designer you know divide that we have had. And I like the folks, you know, focus on accessibility, all that is great. Um, no pressure on you uh, or the team whatsoever, but uh, Emmanuel in the chat room was saying uh, the eShop uh, bike demo, that would be really nice to have in Blazor. So, you know, if you happen to have a, you know, Twitch stream, maybe build it out uh, in front of an audience. Why not? I could, I could use uh, your help, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. All right, so uh, let us uh, switch gears. I know there were uh, a lot of questions here, Ed, but I think the team mm -hmm. uh, tried answering most of them. But if you want to hop on after your section and keep, you know, expanding on them, or we can, you know, talk about some of those uh, towards the end as well. Um, Absolutely. Right. Let's uh, switch gears and uh, see if I can bring my screen back up. Uh, looks like I am, and uh, I will. I will go full screen here one more time. All right. So that was all things web. Uh, and for the next hour, you're stuck with me. Uh, and and not, not to throw shade on uh, Ed, uh, but I can't do things in a web browser. I have to, you know, these are native apps we're talking about, both mobile and desktop. So I actually have mm -hmm. to, uh, you know, wait on the simulators and the you know, native apps to come up a little bit here. But let's, let's have fun. Uh, so now we're talking in a hardcore mobile and hardcore desktop developers. Uh, speaking of mobile, let's begin with uh, .NET Maui because you know uh, this is uh, this is this is a slightly older one. Uh, now it runs on .NET 7 and .NET 8 is on the cusp of you know seeing the first previews. But uh, me and the team is excited about this because 
uh, .NET Mavic kind of started off as an evolution of you know Xamarin forms and how we did cross-platform .NET, but it's quickly evolved into your next generation cross-platform .NET story because now we are not just doing mobile. Uh, everything that I'm showing you here from .NET Mavic also works for desktop. So we are reaching Windows through WinUI and uh, Mac OS through Mac Catalyst. Uh, some interesting ways of you know bringing in the web as well. Uh, so you know truly a lot of benefits here to be had. Uh, true cross-platform solution, single truly shared uh, code base, uh, easy access to all of the platform APIs, uh, read on architectures. So all good things. I'm, I'm a fan. Uh, early days, yes, for sure. Uh, last year was you know um, very busy because they hit .NET 6 uh, on their first GA general availability, and then very quickly had to turn around and support .NET 7. So. Uh, from this point onwards, you're going to see, you know, previews come out for all of the latest .NETs, so uh, we are in good hands. So speaking of .NET Maui, and before I actually dive into this, let's do another quick poll, uh, just to make sure none of you are sleeping. Uh, quick poll uh, for interactivity, right? So if you are looking at .NET Maui stuff, uh, you know, this year, what platform are you choosing to build? Or do you not have any preference at all? Because most people end up, you know, preferring either mobile or desktop. Uh, you know, we have seen an interesting trend where this was meant for mobile, but then we are also seeing a lot of enterprises pick this up and do desktop first because they are trying to, you know, maybe upgrade some of their, uh, you know, older desktop applications into .NET Mavic. So in that case, you're doing Windows or Mac. So uh, tell us what you would target if you were to do this right now. Are you leading towards iOS or Android or are you doing Windows or Mac OS uh, first? So going once and twice and... Ta-da, let's, let's see your responses. And, uh, oh wow, look at that. So, uh, nice split in here between Android and Windows uh, and iOS coming in hot. So essentially what, what it's telling me is exactly that. A lot of folks who are doing maybe Xamarin uh, before are you know moving into .NET Maui. So you're doing iOS and Android first, so you're going mobile first, but you know, a lot of folks are also, you know, switching over from like WinUI 3 or, you know, WPF and, and trying to really make a cross-platform app, but do desktop first. So that is good to know. And I do actually- The tide is it. turning, Sam. The yeah, tide is tide turning. Is turning. <laughs> and, you know, the Mac support is nice because uh, prior to this, you know, we never had had confidence going into desktop uh, with .NET uh, on a Mac. So that's that's good to know. All right, so let's dive in and let's see what um, uh, what we can do. Uh, is my screen visible? Uh, not yet, as the poll goes off. Hold on for a second. I think it's visible. Okay. Um, all right, so let's talk about uh, Teleric UFA Dr. Maui. We have been on this journey, you know, with Microsoft from the early, early days. We had, uh, you know, 14 previews to go along with their 14 previews, and then we hit, uh, you know, zero day support uh, when Dr. Maui came out. So. We're excited about this. It's a polished UI suite. It's the newest one from us uh, for all of your .NET MAUI mobile and desktop apps. Uh, you know, uh, and we work with the latest .NET MAUI bits as of you know last week. So uh, very you know um, uh, you know on point with how .NET MAUI moves along. So what you get uh, from us with .NET MAUI is uh, you know a UI suite that's you know meant, but uh, we don't take this lightly because uh, for the first time you have a grid. A Teleric grid that works seamlessly between mobile and desktop. So we have to be very conscious of how we render things uh, between platforms, but all of that so should be seamless to you as the developer. Uh, you got toolbox support, uh, you got latest support for all of the Visual Studios, and so we're trying to give you as much productivity as we can. So uh, the team has been really busy, uh, and a lot of the features that you're going to see, uh, some of them they cater to mobile, uh, because we are trying to you know bring folks over who are supporting mobile right now, uh, but also a lot of them feature to desktop or cater to desktop, because that's what you know, a lot of enterprises are building. So let's start with the toolbar UI. This is a polished toolbar, uh, as you'd expect from you know modern apps like you know Outlook or Visual Studio. Uh, it's got a sleek you know professional way of uh, you uh, to you know tuck away all of your content and, and how you navigate things. Uh, it kind of mimics that BS toolbar a little bit. Uh, so if you have a smaller surface area, then you have a nice uh, overflow uh, option. So you got you know the buttons and the other things that you can put on it on a strip, and then you have the overflow area. Uh, you have a rich collection of toolbar items that you can put in there, text or you know images that you want to add. You can orient this different ways you want. So uh, you know just a really nice rich uh, toolbar UI for your .NET apps. So that's new. 
And moving on, uh, we have a brand new image editor. A lot of folks were asking about this because, you know, editing images, uh, especially in mobile devices, it's, it's not fun to do this by hand. So we have a brand new image editor, uh, works seamlessly across uh, desktop as well, uh, but it is, you know, a full featured image editor. So you can visualize and pull up, you know, different types of images in different formats. You can, you know, you can import, you can export those out. And it has all the things that you, you know, care about zooming and panning and flipping. Uh, rotation, resizing, and cropping, but it also, uh, you know, helps with a lot of those filters that you want uh, when you are editing those images. Uh, you know, the different types of color and the warmness of filters like hue and saturation, brightness, contrast, blur, uh, you can do all of that. It comes pre-built with the toolbar, uh, which you don't have to use, but, you know, it's, it's really nice to have that, uh, and it has, you know, undo, redo, and reset all of that, so I will try to show you some of this in action. So, a really polished image editor, for both your mobile and your desktop um, you know, apps. It's so done and done. Signature pad. So uh, Ed kind of showed this off for, um, for I think, um, Ajax. Uh, we have that uh, for Dutton Navi as well. It's a signature pad as we expect. You know, this is you know, particularly true for a lot of mobile devices or maybe you're using Dutton Navi in a, you know, in a kiosk or you have like a you know, card type payment where you can just you know, flip the screen and you know, collect a signature from the user. Uh, this is for you. Uh, it'll work with touch or pen, uh, however you want wanting to do it. And you can capture, you can you know save things off uh, in a JPEG or in a PNG. You can control the stroke thickness and and the color. Uh, and there are different types of even handlers that you get access to, so you can you know respond to things uh, as the user is you know working with it. And for all of uh, the UI that I show you. Uh, you know, XAML and C sharp code bases are particularly you know working well with MVVM design patterns, model view view model. So if you're using uh, one uh, either that's built out of the box in .NET Mavi or bringing in an MVVM framework, we want to be uh, working with it. So you know you got command support for almost all of the UI. So that's nice to have. There is a new progress bar. We have had busy indicators before, and those are nice anytime your app is doing something. Uh, that's a little long running uh, that you want to show the user progress. This is a little bit more, you know, hands on because this is can be it can either be determinate or indeterminate mode. So you get to true, you know, show the user true progress of uh, a task as they're you know waiting on it. Uh, you can you know visualize things. You can render things however you want. You can control the color, uh, how much uh, segments you got. Uh, you know, you can the range, the value, and the progress. You get to control all of it. Uh, different, uh, you know, display modes, and you can control the segments, and you can style this, you know, however you want uh, for your app. So you can render this uh, exactly you want uh, to match the rest of your app. We have a brand new accordion control, which is, you know, an accordion is a, you know, old school idea borrowed from the web days, but it's really, you know, handy for mobile because you don't have a lot of space, and yet you're trying to show as much information as you can in a small amount of space. So let the user expand and collapse. It's a, you know, container control. And you can put anything you want inside of it. Uh, you get, you know, uh, an intuitive UX that the user understands, and uh, it has different states that you can programmatically control. And uh, there are different types of animations that you can have while the, you know, the accordion uh, panel is expanding or collapsing. So, uh, really customizable, full-featured accordion UI uh, for all of your mobile and desktop apps. Now. Uh, like these things were, you know, kind of catering maybe a little bit uh, to, uh, you know, mobile devices, although the toolbar, I think, is it's, it's more for desktop. Uh, but the data grid, again, there's nothing, you know, uh, stopping you from, you know, putting any of these heavy data grids on mobile devices, which is, you know, we try to cater to that with, you know, touch surfaces that are a little, you know, better to use. Uh, but, you know, people are putting uh, data grids in giant, busy desktop apps, right? So, our data grids have to be featuring all of the things that desktop users with their mouse and keyboard expect. So uh, a lot of updates, a lot of love has gone into the data grid to make it a truly seamless UX between mobile and desktop, but yet have all of the power that you expect from a desktop data grid. Because people are looking at Dot Navi as the next generation of you know, Windows or Mac desktop development. So they need they need a full featured you know, data grid. So a uh, brand new thing is a frozen columns feature, which was you know, uh, heavily voted. So you can actually pin a certain column and then let the user scroll through so you don't lose the context of you know, seeing something important. So the rest of the user or the rest of the columns can you know, scroll or you know, move with it, but the one or two or any number of columns that you select, uh, those are frozen, those stay uh, with the view and they're always visible. So uh, it's, it's nice to kind of have that pertinent information always be you know, around. So, all right, so with Dutton Maui, we do have, you know, several apps that you can take a look at. So, you know, don't trust anything that I say. Go take a look at some of these demos. Uh, check out the source code. It's all up on GitHub, um, so you can see how we are building apps with Dutton Maui. 
Uh, and again, uh, some of the apps, uh, the, the Crypto Tracker is a great example where it's the same exact app, but the UI is and the US user experience is markedly different between desktop and mobile because we know what platform you're on and we can cater to the views. That does not mean a lot of, you know, reuse in terms or I mean, uh, reinventing the wheel in terms of your UI. You can, you know, break things up nicely into views and then just combine multiple views when you're on desktop, when you have a you know, larger surface area. So uh, we have the crypto tracker, the control sample, which I'll show you. And there's an SDK browser. If you're ever in doubt, like, how do I do this uh, with the grid or the list view or the dropdown? Uh, you got, you know, very real developer focused examples that you can look at. So a lot of things to uh, look at uh, in terms of, you know, sample apps. Now, this one is, uh, you know, add in my uh, kind of uh, pet uh, project for the last, you know, few months. Uh, it's called Blazor Hybrid. So essentially, .NET Mavi lets you bring in some web goodness um, into mobile and desktop apps. And they do it not through Node.js, not through Chromium or anything else, but a modern web view that every platform has, you know, iOS, Android, Windows, and Mac. And within that web view, we can render all types of you know web content, uh, not just Blazor, but Blazor is particularly well suited because Blazor and Docker Mami have the exact same runtime. So everything that Ed showed you, uh, you know, with Blazor, they all work on Docker Mavi. They all work on native mobile on desktop devices, and you can share a lot of the code uh, between you know web and native platforms. You can share the styling, so it's uh, it's, it's a good story all along. So, so Sam, it's. Uh... It's great when the chat is asking questions and your slides are coming up shortly after as if you're almost answering them. But there was a question in chat of which is better, Blazor or, hybrid, or, Blazor or Maui? Uh, and I was just responding that uh, they, while they are not quite one in the same, they, they do cross paths. There, there's like a Venn diagram where they cross paths and we have Blazor hybrid with Maui. Um, and we have an upcoming ebook that we'll talk about this a little bit. Uh, so sure. stay tuned yeah. to telerc.com slash white papers. Yeah, I mean, if you want to do uh, .NET on web and you know the latest and greatest .NET runtime, Blazor is likely what you'll pick. And if you want to go native, you go .NET Navi. And the good news is you can bring over, if you have teams that are already doing Blazor or even you know other uh, web technologies, you can bring them all over into .NET Navi. So, you know, choose uh, which way you want to go. Is it, you know, HTML and Blazor and, you know, components or is it C Sharp and XAML uh, with that in Maui? Uh, so uh, they both work uh, particularly well together. Let's talk about Xamarin. Now, this is kind of where things began, you know, seven, eight years back, uh, we first started doing .NET cross-platform for, you know, iOS or Android. Uh, and, uh, you know, Xamarin is the present reality for a lot of people. And there is, you know, uh, I mean, there might be a sense of rush, but also, I mean, you got a year and a half uh, before, uh, you know, support eventually will stop, but again, you're fine. And even after that, you're going to be fine. And we're, we're going to be here, uh, right here for you. So our Telerik year for Xamarin is a very, very rich component suite. Years of engineering pulled, you know, poured into it. Uh, it's got all of the UI that you expect, uh, all of the customization and the virtualization and the performance tuning works seamlessly for, you know, iOS or Android, Windows or Mac. Uh, easy to get NuGet packages, easy to get, you know, templates to get started with, lots of sample apps in the store. Um, so this is your present reality. So stay in there. There's no, you know, nothing wrong with that. Um, you, we will keep you productive with all of the Xamarin UI bits. But uh, again, whenever you're ready, there's a lot of, you know, help now uh, in terms of, you know, migration to Xamarin uh, or to .NET Maui. Whenever you're ready, there are some tools that will do some of it. But some folks are saying you're better off, you know, you know, taking care of things, uh, you know, a little bit manually if you want to control all of the pieces. But it's it's a very you know easy switch over that we're talking about. But for Xamarin, uh, we still have you know love that we're pouring into the suite um, and uh, data grid is something that a lot of people use. Uh, so that is a very new feature uh, that is interesting and uh, you know highly voted for. So people will search for things and you want to take them to a specific part of the data grid. So we have a new scroll to item API. So essentially you can ask it to jump down to a certain uh, you know item that's in the data grid, be it the last item or somewhere in the middle. And you get programmatic control. Uh, so when you're, you know, you know, binding the data grid with something else in your UI, like a search or a filter, uh, this is just a, you know, easier user experience uh, for for the end user. We also have a new update for the side drawer, which is a heavily used control because it's, you know, perfect for navigation. You, when you think about, you know, smaller form factors, you want to have that uh, menu tucked away, and then uh, that menu drops, you know, open, and then you have all of your content and your navigation. But when you think about this on like iPads or slightly bigger devices, 
maybe you don't want to, you know, you know, want that many to go away the moment the user taps or clicks outside. Uh, so this was heavily requested. The side drawer now has a, you know, functionality where the default is still, if you, you know, click or tap outside, it goes away, but you can keep it on if you wanted to. So there's just a quick API flag. Uh, so navigation and all for all of your content remains visible all through. Um, so uh, that just makes sense for some devices, maybe. And document processing libraries, we will talk about this a lot more, but essentially we have one set of uh, .NET libraries that uh, we do uh, for document processing. Uh, you know, we're talking about spreadsheets and word processing and Excel spreadsheets. You don't have to jump out to you know, third-party libraries and you can do all of it. And whatever we do in there, uh, every one of our UI suite gets the benefit. So Xamarin, .NET, Maui, Blazor, WPF, WinForms, they all you know, benefit from what's been done in document processing. So you know, as you can see, love being poured into Xamarin as well. Uh, so all, all good things. Uh, we do have uh, you know, a lot of sample apps that you can you know, check out. These are in the iOS or Android or Windows store. So go you know, check out some of the UI, uh, some of the apps. Uh, the source code is also in open source. So you can take a look at how you know, we have built some of these apps. So, you know, plenty of inspiration, essentially. So with that, uh, seeing is believing, uh, but keep in mind, I am going to show you things uh, on a simulator, which might be a little slow. So let's uh, let's start with Dr. Mavi really quick. Uh, so I'm showing you here, I'm going to uh, start a, a session and talk through it. So I'm showing you. Uh, the app that you can actually get uh, from the app stores uh, for .NET Maui. This is our sample app, and I'm, you know, uh, pulling this up on my iPhone 14 simulator. It's a cold start, um, but essentially, uh, if you wanted to get to this source code, one is if you, you know, head out and uh, install the stuff yourself. Like if I head out to Telerate.com, if I go to Mobile Components, you got Maui and you got Xamarin. Uh, if I come into Maui, if I, you know, get the free, free trial, or you, you already have the licenses, then all of the source code is, you know. Uh, available to you once you download that. Uh, so let me show you my finder here. So this is where I install stuff in a single folder called progress. And you can see all of the .NET Maui iterations we have had from .NET Maui 0.0.1 all the way up to .NET Maui 5.0.0. It's been quite a journey. So all of the binaries and the examples uh, and the packages, the NuGet packages, they're all in there. Uh, so you can take a look. Or if you just want to play around with the UI, then you can go to the store and just uh, you know download and install the app. Uh, so I'm running that app locally here through Visual Studio, and uh, right here is my iPhone uh, 14 simulator, and it's you know coming up, uh, and uh, it's just trying to get past uh, you know launch screen, and then you're going to see uh, pretty much all of the UI that uh, Telerik UI for Dr. Maui has uh, in one screen. It's uh, getting past it really quick. All right, here we go. So. That's him. Uh, Right. Did you have a question? We, we had a question come in that we can chat about when uh, you've got a second there. Um, okay. Somebody was asking um, if you can use existing uh, Blazor applications to port them over to uh, Blazor Hybrid or if that's a complete rewrite. And, no, no, it's not. It's, get a that's, pause that's, and we chat about that. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a you know good use case for a lot of people. Uh, so give us a minute. Uh, I'll, I'd like to get back to that. Uh, so here's the app, and it has literally all of the UI that we make. Uh, some of the new ones see here are accordion. Like I said, uh, really easy to just get a feel of what this does. You know, it has collapsible things and expandable things, so you can you know uh, have a lot of content within a, a small amount of area. And you can make this look however you want. Like the styling APIs are really flexible. So this one looks like a button that you can close or you know, expand. So make it look like however you want. And while you're on this, uh, it's a little better when you pull this up on slightly bigger form factors like iPads or you know, Android tablets. But right here is the link to the source code. So if you want to know how exactly we are rendering this particular view, it'll take you directly into the folder in GitHub. Uh, which has the source code for this. So you can you know, take a look at how we are doing things. So while we're on this, let's show you uh, some of the new things that are in here. Uh, the data grid, I'm gonna save off uh, that for a desktop uh, look, because it's, you know, um, it's, it's so much better uh, and more functional uh, on, a, on a desktop, but it works just fine on mobile as well. Uh, let's show you the, um, uh, let's see, go down here. I'm trying to find the new image um, editor. Yeah, uh, there it is, image editor. Okay, so this is a full-fledged image editor. You pick one, uh, pick an image here, uh, and it comes with the that taskbar that I mentioned. So I can come in here. You have all of the options. I can, you know, rotate. I can flip. I can do you know, all the things that you expect uh, from a modern, you know, uh, you know, image editor. 
and I can crop, I can, you know, resize things. And then if I go into some of the color modes, I got, you know, you know saturation and contrast and hue, all the different things. So I can, I can really go to town with it and I can actually save off the image once I'm done. Uh, so really, really flexible image editor that is, you know, fully featured for all of your mobile and desktop apps. Uh, now, one more thing I wanted to show you here was the toolbar. Um, and then we'll switch over uh, to look, oh, the progress bar. I missed the progress bar. That's kind of nice, uh, particularly on uh, mobile devices. So let's switch over here to the uh, progress bar here. It is a progress bar that shows you, you know, literal progress or uh, indeterminate progress based on however you are, you know, wanting this to, you know, work out. And anytime you're doing a heavy-handed task, uh, feel free to use this to, you know, show something to the user that tells them that, hey, uh, my, my app is doing something. And you can make this look like however you want. If you look at some of the configuration, all of the APIs, there are more APIs than that's what's on screen here, but the track color, the text color, the display mode, uh, the animations, uh, the value, and, and everything about this is something you can control. So you can make it uh, look however you want. And then you always have the busy indicators if it's just something you want to throw up to say, hey, I'm doing something busy. Uh, so that's just the app. And again, you can take uh, take a look at this app and you know everything that it has uh, for all of the UI on your mobile devices. However, uh, let, me, let me close this. And uh, we're going to come back here to Visual Studio and this change where we are running this app. So let's actually make this run on desktop here. So I'm going to pick Mac because uh, I am actually on a Mac. I do also have uh, Windows running, um, but you know iOS development uh, tends to be a little bit easier when you already have a Mac uh, that's your host. Um, so let's build the same exact app, but we're now going to look at things from uh, a desktop perspective. So think about somebody who is building .NET MAUI for desktop first, so Mac or, uh, or Windows. And the moment you have more real estate, the uh, user expect, you know, expectations are a little different uh, with mouse and keyboard. So we want to make sure that uh, you're, you're you know, set up to, you know, for success uh, for you know, larger form factors. So we'll give it a second uh, for this to come up. And I'm uh, screen sharing while I'm you know, pulling up uh, simulators. So you can understand a little bit of the uh, waiting that you have to do sometimes. But it you know, keeps things real. I can you know, try to simulate things on a web, but just won't be the same because it's not really a native app at that point. All right, so here you have uh, the same exact control sample, but now it's on desktop. Uh, so if I uh, get into the data grid here, uh, you will notice that everything that you expect from us, uh, from a modern data grid, uh, be it on Windows or Mac, this is a full feature data grid. It just happens to be cross-platform. So in here is uh, is a new uh, thing called frozen columns. That's a new feature. So you'll notice that uh, once this uh, data binds and renders, uh, there is an order ID. And maybe that's the one, or maybe I also want the order date. So these are my frozen columns. And then I can scroll all I want, uh, but I never lose sight of the pertinent information. So that's nice. And I got things like, you know, different types of columns. I can do, you know, aggregate functions. I can do customization. I can do grouping, filtering everything that you, you know, desire from, um, you know, a, a modern data grid, uh, you, you have it in there. Now, the one other uh, control that I wanted to show you on desktop is, uh, is the toolbar control. So think about any type of app where you uh, need to show something like a toolbar that you get in Visual Studio, uh, and you want to, you know, have that rich experience, that's the toolbar, and you get to put whatever you want in it. The images that, and texts are kind of the natural thing. Uh, and again, it has it can do drop downs. It can do anything that you want. But here's the nice thing: if I actually shrink this uh, really down to a smaller uh, form factor, you will see that it doesn't have the space to render all of it. Uh, so it actually goes into what's called an overflow mode. Now, once my screen catches up a little bit, um, you get the beach ball of uh, death with Mac sometimes. There you go. So that's the overflow menu. So it actually understands that hey. Uh, it's responsive, but I don't have enough space to render the toolbar, so let me get you an overflow area. So, you know, think about Visual Studio, think about Outlook. Anytime you have those, you know, uh, long toolbar options, uh, when you shrink a window, it goes into an overflow area. So that's .NET MAUI in a nutshell. Uh, so a lot of love being poured into this. And since you asked, uh, let's show you one quick example here. Uh, I got six more minutes in the last half an hour I want to spend on desktop. So uh, let's show you one quick thing here. Uh, since Ed showed off all the Blazor goodness, and so you don't have to restart your app if you already are supporting, you know, um, uh, web uh, UI, uh, web uh, apps, then you can, you know, share a lot of the code and just bring them over into a shell and make it work on desktop as well. So here is 
a project which has it, it's a Telerik, uh, you know, it's a dotnet Mavi project with the Blazor template, and with that, what you get is this project SDK of the style Razor, and with that, you know, project style, I can actually bring in a Telerik UI for Blazor right into a desktop or a mobile app. It, that doesn't care because the NuGet package just requires an SDK Razor style project. So this is a desktop dotnet Mavi app or a mobile dotnet Mavi app, but it doesn't stop me from bringing in uh, Telerik UI for Blazor right here in my NuGet packages, right? So once I have that, uh, the rest of it is pretty much exactly how you do, you know, Blazor in my imports.razor. I'm going to bring in the Telerik bits in here. In my Maui program.cs, which is how the Maui program, you know, kick starts, I got the usual, you know, app builders, and I will drop in the Blazor web view, which is what Dot and Maui uses as a modern web view. And then I have to bring in add Telerik Blazor, which is exactly what you do for, you know, web apps as well. And then uh, the first view, uh, I just have a couple of references to Kenda UI themes and the Telerik Blazor JavaScript file, and that's it. Then in my main page.xaml, that's my Blazor web, web view because I have no other XAML in here. Uh, and then if you look at the index view, which is pretty much just the Blazor view, just you know dropped inside of a pages directory, it's all my Blazor uh, you know syntax, my buttons, my barcodes, my uh, a circular page and a card view. Uh, but when I run this, uh, this is going to be a .NET Mavi app running on either, you know, mobile or desktop, but it's showing all of the Blazor UI that you, you know, uh, love. So you, if you already have a web app, you don't need to restart from scratch. You can just, you know, separate things out nicely, move your pages, move your styles, some of the controls onto a separate, uh, you know, um, like a Razor class library, RCL, and then reference that RCL from your .NET Mavi project and your Blazor project. So essentially this whole thing is a giant web view and all of your Blazor stuff renders just fine in it. And I can show this on mobile, I can show this on desktop. So essentially a lot of code sharing is what uh, you can you know, um, get into with Blazor and .NET Mavi. So Ed, did I say all of that right? Yep, it's looking good, Sam. And uh, we've we've also got uh, that ebook I mentioned earlier. So mm -hmm. uh, we have we have lots of great white papers and ebooks over at uh, telerk.com slash white papers. Uh, keep your eye on that section. I, I just wrote an ebook up about how to do exactly what you just said there. And there's some unit testing included and some of the, the kind of gotchas of working on mobile as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so even if you're familiar with, you know, really familiar with Blazor and you're moving over to Maui, there's just mobile stuff. Right. Uh, welcome to welcome to our pain. Welcome to our world. Yeah. There are permissions and there are a variety of, you know, things you have to deal yeah. with. Um, local host is not not a thing it's right yeah. the device doesn't know it doesn't know there's local host running on your right. your server yeah. somewhere yeah, yeah. so but, i included yeah. those in the ebook so hopefully that yeah, helps some people yeah. out yeah and you can really envision a project where it's it's truly uh you know blazer everywhere where you got blazer that's you know meant for the web and then a separate project which is blazer meant for all of your dot and maui stuff and then a separate shared uh ui library so you can really you know, mix and match and share a lot of code uh, in between. So um, all good stuff here. Let's uh, let's switch gears here a little bit. Uh, before I go over to Windows, let's go back to uh, my uh, deck one more time. Let's switch over to desktop. All right, so uh, let's go to full screen here. Uh, let's talk about all of your hardcore uh, Windows uh, desktop developers. We co covered a little bit of the Windows and uh, Mac desktop developers with .NET Maui, but this is the hardcore stuff. So before we go into that, now you have a lot of choices. You know, how you build desktop applications. Are you sticking to, uh, you know, the, you know, the older ways of doing things and uh, are you mixing and matching and, and this is what's so let, let, let's bring up the poll as, as we are talking through this this is what makes me excited because i can take uh, a wpa for a win prompts application that maybe i had started 10 years back and i can make that run on dotnet 6 i can make that run on dotnet 7 so i can really you know reuse and, and think about roi where I'm, you know, I don't have to, you know, upgrade everything. I can bring in a little bit of Blazor. I can bring in some modernness with like XAML islands into my uh, Windows desktop applications. So if you are building desktop applications this year, what would you rather do? Because a lot of people, uh, the answer is WPF and WinForms because that's what you're maintaining. That's your, you know, present reality. That's what you're running in your business. Uh, but are you, you know, going a little forward with Windows and doing WinUI 3? Or are you okay with the cross-platform abstraction that .NET Mavi offers where you get to Mac as well? So um, people, we really want to know where are you? What type of framework are you using uh, to build modern desktop applications this year? All right, going once, going twice. 
And let's see your responses. I'm really curious about this one here, though. Done at Maui. Oh, look at wow, that. wow, look at that. That's a surprise. I'm, I'm a little me. surprised, yeah. Yeah, because I would have thought a lot of it is WPF because that's, you know, the hardcore way. Because, uh, like, WPF apps can be, you know, touch-friendly. They run on kiosks. They are amazingly, you know, powerful. Um, but, you know, good to see. Good to see so many of you really thinking about .NET Maui as your cross-platform solution. Uh, like I said, I mean, a lot of folks are doing desktop first with .NET Maui. We have, you know, um, you know enterprise customers who are looking at .NET Maui, building a desktop first. Uh, they have no need for mobile right now. But maybe, you know, three years down the line, they might have a need for mobile but it still stays uh, within a single code base. So good to know. And again, if you're on WinForms and WPF, you know, be assured you're in good hands. Uh, you have all of the tooling that you need uh, from us and Microsoft to you know, keep you productive and uh, have some very, very modern UI uh, for your applications. So there are a couple of different things we can do uh, for desktop developers. Let's talk about WinUI, WPF, and uh, WinForms a little bit here. Uh, UWP, whole, not a whole lot has changed, but let's talk about these three. So WinUI is, the latest uh, Windows UI and UX stack. Uh, you know, undoubtedly that's Windows going forward. Uh, it builds on top of all of the WinUI 3, uh, you know, benefits that you expect, uh, truly native Windows UI, uh, you know, extensive API, fluent design system, uh, and you can run this both as a store app or, as well as Win32. Now we have uh, been on this journey for a while now uh, with Windows app SDKs being like 0.5 back in the days. Now it's up to 1.2 uh, and really, you know, uh, Behind the like 1.0, that was kind of a cut over and everything is very modern and you have full access to all of the Windows APIs. We are at version 2.4.0 with our uh, Telerik UI for WinUI. Really, really rich UI component suite that gives you everything that you, you know, expect to find from a Telerik suite. Works with MVVM, has accessibility built in, has localization. Uh, so hopefully this you know, keeps you productive. And, you know, a lot of enterprises are looking at, you know, UI suites like, uh, you know, WinUI and trying to see if they have everything to build a really top-notch uh, desktop experience. And the answer should be yes, because if you look at how we have, you know, evolved with WinUI over the last, you know, two or three years, everything that you expect, like data grids that are full-featured, list views, schedulers, you know, charts of variety of types, uh, gauges, spark lines, ribbons uh, is, is very popular for Windows, you know, user, user experiences. Everything is right there, including, you know, document processing library support. So uh, it's it's really full featured and ready for you to use. So a couple of uh, brand new things in Teneric UI for WinUI. We uh, have a brand new calculator, uh, which does exactly what you expect. It's a calculator, but it does a little bit more than just the basic things. It will do some more advanced, you know, mathematical calculations. It has, you know, memory functions built in. You can have a clear, clear all, delete options. Uh, you can, you know, automate a lot of things. You can have customizable look and feel. Uh, and, you know, the, your users don't have to switch context and, you know, pull up a calculator on the side, you know, to do something within your app. You can just, you know, give them a calculator so they can just do what they are wanting to do mathematically right inside of your app itself. So. Very exciting, brand new UI, uh, a calculator that's you know full featured. But we would not just give you a calculator and you know be uh, be done with it, because that can now be put inside other things, and that's where the calculator picker UI comes in. So envision uh, you know a grid where you are trying to edit some rows. Envision a list view. Envision you know a form data where you're trying to calculate somebody's you know you know bonus or whatever it is that, you know that you are wanting to calculate. Anytime the user needs to perform some mathematical operations, you can throw in a calculator picker, up comes the calculator with its all of its features, and it's just embedded inside of a you know, bigger control, and it just works exactly how you expect a calculator to work. So you're essentially giving off more power to the user, not having them switch context. So a modern calculator picker UI is you know, done and ready for you inside of a UI. So let's uh, let's actually go through all of the uh, desktop suites, and then I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to show you some demos here. Let's talk about, WPF and WinForms, right? And this is uh, this is something to be proud of, like how many .NETs we run on, right? If you are on .NET framework, you know, we have folks talking about 4.8 and 4.7, be at peace, you're gonna be fine for the you know the next 20 years. If you're on 3.1, uh, we have had a couple of long-term support uh, .NET releases, 3.1 was one, 6 was one, uh, .NET 8 is gearing up for one, there's also ARM, we run on all of those things, right? Now, eventually, .NET 5 support, you're going to see Microsoft, you know, uh, have that fall off. So we are going to also end support for that. But otherwise, it runs on every .NET, which is something to be said about, you know, WPF and WinForms apps running on 
the latest Windows 7 and Windows 8. So uh, there is no, you know, uh, you don't have to, you know, redo things. You can just move your apps over onto a more modern, uh, you know, runtime of .NET. So let's talk about WPF. This is Windows Presentation Foundation, been around, super, super rich, you know, component suite, 150 plus controls, just about everything that you can think of, it's there in our WPF and WinForm suites. When we look at, uh, you know, upcoming suites like .NET Maui or Blazor, we look at what we have done uh, for desktop for inspiration. It just has so much. Uh, so brand new in it is an office navigation bar. So think about Outlook and think about how it lets you completely switch context of what you're doing with just a few buttons. And you are switching from email to calendar to notes or to contacts. That's exactly what this one is for. It's a navigation bar UI and you get to decide what the content is. So maybe it's, you know, order menus, maybe it's customer management, maybe it's, you know, some other, you know, CRM uh, type application that you're building. It's obviously inspired by Outlook, but it's, you know, full featured. So you can put whatever you want in it. Uh, you, it can have a compact mode or a full display. And then uh, as you are hovering through the different, you know, options, you also get a peak window. So you can show what exactly you want uh, within that window uh, for like a minimalist subset of what that uh, view is about. So really powerful UI, uh, really uh, you know, saves you a lot of space and helps the user switch contexts when they want to uh, in an effortless way. Now this one, uh, I will try to show you a demo. Um, this one's uh, rather exciting. So we have had a maps control, which does you know maps uh, and it plugs into every type of you know, provider that you can want. One of the things that uh, we did not have support for is vector tiles. And when we talk about you know vector uh, data, we are talking about geospatial uh, geometrical data, where all of the actual data is uh, in the form of the actual geometries, but then you can layer it up and each of the layers can have their own JSON style definitions. So you can really cater to how exactly the map looks like. So now we have vector tile uh, support in our maps, which is you know heavily, heavily requested. So we are delighted to bring this. Lots of customizable uh, customization options, uh, options, as you can you know, imagine. Uh, and we work with a lot of you know the providers out of the box, like Mapbox and MB tiles and URI vector tiles uh, and more. So you know bring in whatever that uh, your, your S3 type uh, providers bring in whatever you're using. We are you know happy to work with our Map uh, UI and be able to let you style those uh, you know vectors, uh, vector tiles, however you want. So really powerful, uh, really exciting uh, update here to the WPF suite. Uh, the schedule view, uh, which is, you know, for all types of calendar and schedule views, uh, this, if you're going to understand, if you're looking at a calendar that shows you a year's worth of, you know, things, it's a lot of stuff, right? So as you scroll, uh, we now have a lot of, uh, you know, a big performance boost. There's virtualization that's built in. So we try to be careful how much we're binding. And we are, as you're scrolling, we're binding the next, you know, 100 or 200, you know, resources or items in your collection. So really smart in how we do that. Uh, so really uh, a big performance boost and leads to a smoother uh, user experience for the user. Uh, there are lots of, you know, updates all around. Uh, the rich text box, which is a really, you know, uh, uh, a rich editing tool, uh, kind of word-like editing tool that's inbuilt. Uh, it has a, a new uh, selection mode, so you can kind of you know, select a whole sentence or a whole word. Uh, the pivot grid, uh, it's great for, you know, showing different types of data, but a lot of people use it for OLAP, which is for, uh, you know, online analytics, so where you have like a data warehouse and you're trying to, you know, pull things out of a cube. Uh, now we can do that uh, lazy loading. So essentially helps with performance, it's virtualized. So essentially as you scroll or as you click around, it can go pull off that other uh, next data set that it needs to display. So performance is better. Uh, chart view now gets what's called uh, a histogram support, which is essentially for continuous data, trying to see trends in the frequency of data. And we have a specific control called the scatter range bar series, where it's essentially bar uh, charts, but both the height and the width of the bar have an important meaning uh, because it's, it's you know two dimensional data that we're trying to chart. And you pair that with the chart histogram source, and now you have a you know histogram that you can render right inside of your uh, WPF apps. And everything document processing wise, it's you know all across uh, as we have talked about. So that's with you know WPF. Uh, switching gears to WinForms, um, you know, probably you know uh, our oldest running. Uh, UI suite, uh, you know, alongside with you know Ajax, uh, these things are very very productive. No, you know, no two ways about it. So that gets a brand new toolbar form UI, which is essentially think of it as a modern toolbar and a content area to gonna go along with it. So it's you know one and done type of a UI 
to save a lot of space. You can, you know, uh, render a lot of content in there. The title bar, it's really customizable. You can have different sections in it and, you know, put whatever you want inside of it, buttons, drop downs, text boxes. Uh, so, you know, think about Visual Studio, think about, you know, Outlook or Excel. Anytime you have that, you know, top toolbar that's really busy with lots of icons, lots of, you know, features for the user, that's what you can pull off with uh, the toolbar form. We have a new taskbar button. So essentially, uh, on Windows, uh, the taskbar is you know smart. It can it's not just to show you that your app is running. It's also to show a lot of extra information like uh, you know shortcuts to different you know popular tasks that the user or that the app can do, or any of the internal commands, uh, or you know showing like uh, a loading indicator or a badge. Uh, so you can do all of that with the taskbar button UI. You just drop it in. Uh, inside of your WinForms application, and then you, you can get to define exactly what that customizable look uh, is when the user right clicks on it, and you can have a flexible API that shows you all of those things, like what are some of the tasks, what are some of the you know shortcuts, what are some of the loading indicators, or even like extra buttons that you know show the user that something has been done on the app. So a full featured uh, task taskbar button, uh, you know, it's done ready for you for your WinForms apps. A uh, little bit more updates around uh, WinForms. Windows 11 is here. Hopefully, uh, I'm actually still on Windows 10 on uh, one of my devices, but I'm running Windows 11 on two of my other windows. But and hopefully, if you can upgrade, you should. It's the newest thing. It has a you know beautiful look and feel about it. Uh, so uh, WinForms gets a brand new Windows 11 theme, which exactly you know mimics that look and feel. Uh, we have had a syntax editor, which is a fantastic control for you know rich text editing. It shows you all of the built-in syntax highlighting, especially if you're you know editing code inside of your uh, you know app. Uh, that's really nice to see. Or even like HTML that you're showing, uh, all of that functionality is now preserved. But now we also have word wrap. So as you shrink, uh, it, it knows how to wrap and not you know cut off the text and have you scroll. Um, we have a brand new glyph uh, front that we're using all around. So that kind of matches the Windows 11 iconography. So, you know, lots of smoothness, lots of nice things all around and document processing updates. All right, now, uh, before I switch over to showing you some of the desktop things, this one is what Ed and me have been mentioning. We have a set of libraries that's called document processing. It's for you to be able to create, edit, manipulate, and work with PDF, Word, and Excel files without ever leaving your application, without ever needing to go do anything else on Office because it's all built in for you. And these are .NET libraries. So everything that we do here, you get the benefits from across all of the UI suites from you know, web to you know, mobile and desktop. So uh, a few you know, really interesting things uh, that have been done uh, with uh, document processing, PDF processing now gets a brand new encryption mode. It's an inclusion algorithm of AES 256, which I actually have no idea what it is, but those who need to know, know it's an industry standard. Uh, there's a new search API. So if you have a big uh, PDF that you're rendering, now you can search uh, very easily. Also does like regular expression support. So it can pinpoint uh, which exact page and location you are in the PDFs. And it just lets you, you know, have the user jump to that uh, really easily. Word processing now gets table of contents, which is you know it's self-explanatory, but there's also a new table of authorities. This is particularly too for you know legal documents where you, people have like citations and references. It can list out all of those things uh, automatically based on your uh, you know word processing and how you what type of content you have. Or we're looking for those flags, and we can render the table of content. We can render the table of authorities uh, you know automatically. So a lot of good stuff in here. So let's uh, take a quick look here. I am you know, 16 minutes in. That should be fairly good amount of time. Let's switch over here to my Windows machine. So let's actually show you. Um, let's show you uh, WPF first. So again, you can get uh, access to these um, you know demos that I'm showing you either by you know going out and checking out uh, the store which has those sample apps, or uh, you can you know just get the bits and just run it yourself locally. So this is. UI for WPF, uh, make sure you look at uh, the release, that's R1 2023, and all of the controls that we you know, have listed out in that, uh, just take a look at the list here for WPF or for WinForms. It's just an exhaustive list of editors and data management and data visualization, layouts, navigation, interactivity, scheduling, you name it, we, we got it all. So here is the brand new Office navigation bar. Uh, which is exactly what you know how Outlook uh, is is what you're used to with Outlook. So this is my email, and I switch over here. Now notice when I before I even tap on it, when I you know mouse over, that's the peak window. So you know subset of what uh, you know 
actual UI or the content is like. So you get to customize that. Uh, here's my contacts and here are my notes. And when I switch over, it's just a quick, you know, context switch of showing you the calendar or I can switch over here to my contacts and I've chosen contacts. So think about however, uh, you know, you have your content laid out for your apps. If there are different types of content, this might be a particularly good way of, you know, uh, trying to help the user switch context with a minimal uh, UI that's the office navigation bar. Uh, this is the pivot grid that I talked about. So if you're binding this to, you know, data sources, uh, let's go over to the all app data source here. Uh, that's the load on demand. Uh, it's actually, you know, plugging into, uh, you know, a remote source here. But when I tap on that, that's when it actually goes out and gets uh, the next set of data. So it is literally load on demand. So we're not binding things as we go along. It's lazy loading, uh, which is what you want. Uh, schedule view, uh, you kind of saw this uh, nicer in the uh, in the you know uh, deck itself. But if I look at um, some of the resource headers that are now virtualized, so think about hundreds and thousands of appointments. And as I scroll through this, uh, it's going to be really really fast because it's everything is virtualized. So great performance boost in here. And if you are into statistics, if you are doing anything that's analytical, now you can you know just do uh, histograms just so easily with the new. Uh, the red uh, scatter range bar series. So again, each of the bars have a meaning, both horizontal and vertical. Uh, so we can pair it with a nice, uh, you know, um, uh, source and you know have you render histograms. So take a look at all of this. It's all out there for you. And again, just like the way uh, Ed showed up with uh, with web, we can just tap into code here, and you get to see exactly how things are rendered. So you don't need to even pull up Visual Studio. It's all right there for you. It's just so easy to just see exactly how each of these views have been rendered. Uh, so that's nice. And then um, let me pull up uh, WinUI next. Uh, I will show you that in Visual Studio or I'm running a little short on time. Let me also pull up the app so um, you get to see exactly what WinUI app looks like. We'll do both at the same time. So while Visual Studio is coming up um, and it's going to try launching the desktop UI. Um, so this is the whole code base that you know powers our you know sample app, and um, this has oh it's wanting me to update to an admin view, which I can. And let's go back here to the WinUI desktop solution. Oh, there was one thing about WPF that I uh, want to show off. Uh, something about the maps that is you know so cool with the vector maps. Uh, but let's do WinUI first really quick, and then we'll we'll switch quickly back to uh, WPF for a second. So this is a full-on app. Uh, you can see all of the dependencies and all of the examples that we have are right in here uh, that you know power some of the views that I'm going to show you. Uh, so if you wanted to see some of the newer ones, like what's uh, what's the calculator? How is that rendered? Well, you, you have the code right here. Uh, so let's actually see the app in action. So this is the app that shows you exactly what's new and updated. You can search for and look for specific controls. Here's the calculator. It's exactly what you'd expect it is. It's a calculator uh, that does uh, everything that you want. And again, you can see the code. Uh, the rendering it is just one line of code, RAD calculator, and that, that's enough to pull it up. But the more realistic example of this is the calculator picker. So envision you having a list view or a data grid uh, where you're trying to, you know, offer the user some, you know, edit rights, but there's some math, there's some calculations to be done. So feel free to, you know, pop in that calculator picker, and now you get the calculator view inside you know, of a bigger control. So that makes it, you know, nicer. Uh, and uh, we never really talked about some of the document processing ones here. Uh, we got PDF processing with the new encryption. Uh, this one's the new word processing, uh, which has the new uh, table of contents. So uh, I can, you know, see through my document, I can load up a sample document here. Uh, and you can see, like, I can look at, you know, headings, I can look at some specific fields and try to build up that uh, table of contents, or I can go to my uh, list of references or citations and try to build up that, uh, you know, table of authorities right in here. And when I'm done, when I hit, the, you know, uh, go ahead and, you know, generate the uh, Word document, or everything is, you know, uh, saved with, you know, high fidelity. So uh, that's just a quick look at WinUI. And again, uh, take a look at all of this uh, UI. They do have, you know, light mode and dark mode support. It's just, uh, just a lot of UI that's, you know, uh, all ready and, uh, you know, waiting for you to light up on your know, UI desktop applications. A lot of UI in here. Uh, let's actually uh, switch gears one last time back to WPF because I uh, did not show you uh, something that's really cool. Uh, this is not in the demo itself, but uh, one of our engineers uh, had to put this together because uh, there are some, you know, restrictions on uh, some of the API licensing keys. 
So let's go in here and I'm going to just run this app to show you. Uh, let's go in here, Netcore 3, and I'm going to pull up this application here. So this is trying to show you the new vector tile support, right? So think about any time you're trying to have, uh, you know, a geospatial or a map type application that you're trying to render. This now plugs into Mapbox or S3 or any of the other, you know, vector tile providers. And it's just a rich, rich experience. This is the mapping UI. And uh, you can really just, you know, zoom around uh, and, and the vectors move and the styles move with them. And I can, you know, really control which uh, type of zooming I want. I can go all the way back to the world. Uh, and then you can see just how uh, nice that experience is uh, as I'm zooming around. This is all vector data, so a tremendous amount of information. Uh, and I can switch this around. So I can do a street view, uh, in which case it really goes down to a street level. Or let's just say I'm building a mapping where I have, uh, I don't like any of the you know, default views. I want to roll with my own. So you can actually have your own custom JSON, which you know styles your maps exactly you want, uh, the way you want. So any type of vector tile uh, you know, providers that you want to bring in, bring them in, and then you get to style those uh, exactly the way you want. So that's you know, the vector tile support with WPF. Now let's take a quick look at uh, WinForms as well. Okay, so again, you can run this uh, from the store or you can go uh, get the bits and the installer is gonna give you this sample app so you can run this locally. Uh, make sure you're looking at R1 2023, that's the latest release. And again, take a look at some of the controls. You know, everything that you can think of, you know, from interactivity, from forms, to editors, to tools, to layouts, it's all there for you because these are very, very rich, uh, you know, component libraries. Uh, what's new in here is a toolbar form which is essentially, if I look at the first look, it's essentially a form inside, uh, you know, a, a toolbar. So everything is wrapped up inside of this. These are your buttons. These are your drop downs that you get to control exactly what you see. And then this is your content area. So in a small amount of space, you're able to render the toolbar and all of the content that goes with it and the interactivity that you know comes along. So really nice uh, full featured control here. Uh, let's go back and I can actually customize more things about the toolbar. Uh, let's show you the taskbar button here. Uh, so now this is going to be you know, launching a different app just to kind of showcase that. Uh, so let me go ahead and launch this. So now this other app comes up here. And if you look at uh, all the things that we are customizing about this app, like the thumbnail previews, the, the jump list, they're all in here and you get to you know, customize it. So when I right click on this, you get these extra things like uh, links to other things or tasks or any type of shortcuts that the app has. And then as I you know, add or remove more things to it, you can see it's kind of glowing a little bit because these icons have come up now to say that, hey, the user is taking some action on it. Uh, maybe they are you know, trying to uh, you know, trigger a different part of the app or you know, pull up a different task. So uh, those are okay, cancel or whatever info type buttons that you want to throw along. So if you really wanted to utilize uh, you know, the Windows uh, taskbar, this is the taskbar menu option for you. Uh, and hold on, it's trying to Bring that up. Okay, let's close that. And okay, let's remove task. It is uh, a little bit stuck on me, but let's. I wanted to go back to the other one here. And this view is stuck here. I have to speak really fast towards the end here. Uh, I'm not sure why I'm stuck on this window because I'm trying to get out of it. Eventually, maybe. But hopefully, you, you know, you folks get the idea. We, we covered uh, you know, WPF, uh, WinForms, uh, UWP, not a whole lot has changed. Uh, I have that as well, uh, I think. Uh, so that's your know, universal Windows platform demos that has, again, all of the UI, uh, the grids, charts, everything that you care for, it's, it's all right there. And, uh, you know, in particular, the WPF suite, uh, the WinUIC, they have a lot of, you know, sample apps that are really, really polished. So. There is a CRM app. There is a you know uh, an app where you can you know choose your uh, you know your styling. So you get to decide exactly how every uh, part of the UI looks like. So you get to you know choose your own styles and then you export that out. So kind of like Theme Builder, but you know for native desktop applications. So there are lots of examples to look at, lots to be inspired about. So if you're building modern Windows desktop applications, you know please feel free uh, be at peace with whatever you're doing. We want to make you more productive, be it WPF or WinForms or WinUI. Uh, that's all good. But then if you are you know, stepping into a cross-platform story, then .MAUI is you know, here to help. So um, that was a lot of speaking, but hopefully that gives you an idea of all of the Windows uh, specific things we do. Uh, let's go back here and uh, Ed, um, any questions I can help answer? Anything that you want to go back to? Um... 
I mean, we can we can just discuss like uh, the little bit of Maui question, Maui Blazer hybrid questions that we had because uh, mm -hmm. they're really really relevant, especially considering the um, poll answers that we saw. It looks like a lot of the audience was focused on either Blazor or .NET Maui or getting interested in both. Um, so I, I think we we kind of determine like you don't need to rewrite your Blazor app to get into Maui. You can kind of consume that. Um, what are the trade-offs of uh, going with say Maui with XAML versus like a Blazor approach? I mean, there, there doesn't need to be trade-off. It kind of comes down to what you want to do, right? So are you, you know, uh, more comfortable with, uh, you know, C Sharp and .NET or, or XAML. Uh, let me try to show you uh, an app while we're talking through this. It, it comes down to your comfort level. Uh, with .NET and Maui, you're not missing out on anything. You have clear mm -hmm. access to all of the platform APIs. There is nothing native that you cannot do. But when you bring Blazor into it, it's the same exact story. story. So with Blazor now, you can also do all of the native things. So it's kind of the best of both worlds. So take a look at uh, this little uh, you know, project that I have. This is also up on my GitHub if you want to check out. So this is uh, a quick solution called uh, Blazor Everywhere. Essentially what I've done here is uh, the Blazor for web. These are my um, WebAssembly projects uh, that are mm -hmm. client side. Uh, you can choose not to have an ASP.NET hosted server if you don't like, and this shared thing is really the web, you know, the web and the client sharing itself. That's all Blazor for web. But then I have taken away uh, all of the pages and all of the things that are I care about, like like my styles. All of them are out of the Blazor project, uh, and they are into a separate class library like this one here, uh, which essentially has my shared, uh, you know, uh, layouts and my you know shared uh, pages and the styling. And then I also have a .NET, uh, you know, Maui project here, which is, you know, with the Blazor template, so it knows exactly to bring in a web view, but this one also doesn't have the pages. So essentially anything that is shared and common between Blazor for web and Blazor for native, I can keep that in a separate folder. Then I'm truly reusing a lot of things, my styles, my components, they're all reused. And with mm -hmm. Blazor on .NET Maui, I get access to doing all of the native things, all of the platform APIs that I can call uh, from .NET Maui, I can do them from Blazor. So it really is a, is a, it's a good code sharing story. Yeah, I think uh, we've got a, a lot of choices now, which is great. So if you're not if you're not concerned about having a web deployment, you can choose Maui and do desktop and mobile with XAML and C Sharp. Uh, you can even use some CSS in there if you want to. Mm -hmm. um, and then you could also use Blazor with Blazor Hybrid and do HTML, CSS, C Sharp. And then if you do have the uh, the web deployment needed, you can set it up the way that you have it there. Um, and then there's also, of course, you could have companion apps and things running in, right. in Maui that aren't Blazor as well. So you've got lots and lots of choices these days. There's lots of ability to share code between the two platforms, whether you're sharing complete components with Blazor in Blazor Hybrid or just business logic. Um, you know, on the uh, within the application uh, with uh, XAML as a front end or HTML as a front end, but it's all .NET, so you can still at least share business logic at the very least. And then you mm -hmm. can use components and share those as well. Yeah, absolutely. Well said. You know, it's uh, the world is our oyster. I think more than .NET enables so much of code sharing, uh, both UI and business logic. It's it's a good place to be. And again, if you're using any of the, you know, Windows desktop technologies we showed you, uh, it, it doesn't mean that you cannot bring in uh, some Blazor if you really wanted to. So lots of options for you. And of course, we've got you covered everywhere. Let's give a little shout out to our our other teams that are going to be having webinars or, or have had them. Um, so we, we've got you covered in testing. So we've got Test Studio. So you're, if you're building these Blazor hybrid apps and, and Blazor web apps um, and desktop apps, you can test those things uh, yeah, with uh, Test uh, Teller Test Studio. Um, if you're, you know, you're probably going to have some sort of web API on the back end, so make sure you, you know, check out uh, Telerik Fiddler, so you can inspect that traffic going back and forth and do fast debugging. Oh yeah, uh, Fiddler is so lots much. Of dev tools. Yeah. Yeah, Fiddler is so much more than just APIs. It is, you know, your uh, mm -hmm. your middleman between every type of app. It's just mobile and desktop as well, but it just does so much for, you know. Uh, support triaging when your users are you know looking at your app so just a lot and yeah, not to steal any thunder from the the fiddler webinar but uh 
there's if you're doing any Blazor server stuff, there's support for um, WebSocket traffic as well. So I mean, it's like mm -hmm. and we've got stuff across the board for, for all the folks. So a lot of, a lot of good things happen. Absolutely. Yep. All right, so uh, folks, we're going to be mindful of your time. If you want to, you know, just come and hang out with us, you know, see Ed uh, build the uh, eShop demo, uh, come and join us for Twitch, on Twitch. Uh, we are coding most times of the week or most, you know, days of the week. Uh, and, you know, just a quick shout out to our folks who are uh, also, you know, um, in the room here with us. You just don't see their faces. They are the folks who have been answering all of your, you know, questions as we went along. Uh, so uh, they are the ones who actually build the products. So big thank you to them. Uh, for supporting us for this release. They are the ones that actually build the products that we get to talk about, so we stand on their shoulders. But most importantly, thank you to you uh, for, uh, you know, uh, staying with us uh, for a long webinar. Hopefully you see that we're trying to give you all the productivity tools that you need to build engaging experiences that are inclusive uh, and accessible to all. Uh, you know, if you are how we are trying to make you productive, and if you are, a uh, user of our tools for a long time. Uh, thank you for your patronage. Hopefully, every release will try to give you more and more. Um, but uh, I think that's it uh, from Ed and me this time around. Uh, we will see you next week where we have two more webinars where we talk about all of the Kenda UI stuff uh, for all of the JavaScript libraries and then also uh, Fiddler, Just Mock, and uh, reporting that's coming up next week. So that's it uh, from us. And uh, thank you so much, folks. Uh, thank you. And uh, we'll see you on the next webinar. Thanks.